Hi everybody, uh, for this session of the second edition of the AGL Profitability Hub online conference, I have the immense pleasure to welcome Tom Caton, who is the Chief Revenue Officer of AirDNA. And together we are going to discuss how the market data can help you stepping into that new uncharted territory of the post-COVID vacation rental industry. So first of all, Tom, uh, how are you doing? How have you been coping with the lockdown? I know we are both in Barcelona and it has been quite strict. So how are you doing? Oh, it's just been miserable, really. I mean, uh, thank, I mean uh, there's, uh, you can't really complain because so many people out there have it so much worse in so many ways with their health or losing their jobs. But yeah, it's not been a fun few months, but uh, maybe we see some light at the end of the tunnel soon. Yeah. Hopefully we are we are reaching that end and in Spain measures are starting to be to be gradually lifted with different faces. So I think we will soon be able to join our colleagues back to the office and more broadly enjoy, enjoy life because it has been a, a rough couple of months. So let's uh, let's get started with uh, with the questions that uh, that we prepared together. So before we get started, maybe some people don't know uh, who AirDNA is. So can you give us a bit of context about what is the focus of RDNA and what has been uh, your primary focus since this outbreak of COVID-19? Yeah, sure thing. So I uh, co-founded RDNA back in 2015 and our initial mission was to help uh, small-time hosts uh, as me and my co-founders were with a bit of data as there was none. And as the business has grown, there's quite a few more people interested in short-term rental data. So these days we have about 55 people, about 30 in Barcelona, about 2025 in Denver. Um, so, and our historical mission was to provide benchmarking data so you could see how you were doing relative to other people in the area. Um, we were on this path beforehand, but it's particularly accelerated that with the outbreak of COVID-19, what happened last year just doesn't matter anymore. Uh, if you think historically, you think, well, how am I doing? How should I try and perform in July of 2020 versus July of 2019 and you could see the how the market was shifting what rates you can expect to hit now it's irrelevant because July 2020 has zero to do with July 2019 so we focus a lot more on forward data forward pacing of bookings uh, suggested pricing these kind of elements that are a lot more relevant than they were prior to the crisis yeah, of course. And yeah, it's an unprecedented situation. So it's really hard to rely on what was happening last year because lots of things have changed. Some countries in Europe and around the world are still under travel restrictions. So you cannot actually, as a guest or a traveler, go there physically without having a two weeks mandatory quarantine. So of course, the, the whole world of travel has been uh, put upside down by that, uh, by that COVID-19. But uh, since now, the, this crisis has started a few months ago, and we are seeing, and that's the discussions we have also with some of our clients, some locations that are picking up, that are starting to see the light at the end of the, of the tunnel. According to all the data that you have access to, is it a tangible assessment, or is it more micro trends into some very small areas? Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's more the latter, huh? particularly in Europe. Europe has real problems because so many markets are interlinked with other markets so you have your boom areas where domestic travel is available i know you and i talked about switzerland briefly before which is traditionally an outbound market and now those outbound people can't feel comfortable in their markets they're looking to stay locally but it is the uncertainty is just what is flogging this market that here in Spain, you cannot feel confident about being able to leave your province. Even in July, they say maybe the beginning of July that can go back. In the UK, Airbnbs are still heavily restricted. So even those domestic markets, unless you're fortunate enough to be in a country with extraordinarily low cases of coronavirus, it's a real nightmare for, for the bookers and for the hosts. So I think you can find areas... Uh, that are having some success. And I think for the domestic market, you can be hopeful for the end of the summer to start to see a number of bookings come in that may even exceed previous years. But generally, Europe is in a real bind. And we see that, for example, staying in vacation rentals in Florence, 
uh, up to now, from all the review data we've collected, 97% of guests come from outside Italy. So if those 97% do not feel confident in being able to book, I know Italy has said it will allow foreign tourists from mid-June. Can you really rely on that, though? It is absolutely awful. America, the United States, has much greater strengths. There doesn't seem to be much in the way of restricting, restricting people traveling around the US. Of course, people have their own health concerns. When you look at a city like New Orleans, where it's the other way around, 90% of the guests staying in Airbnbs are domestic travelers. They just have, uh, it seems every financial crisis, Europe always seems to come out the worst. And I think in our particular world of vacation rentals, it's gonna be really tough. And we haven't even really reflected on the traditional inbound countries, the club med of Greece and Spain, who have such enormous GDP dependency on tourism. It's not gonna be a good summer. Um, there's, when there's no other way to gloss over that. So there, there are some small bright spots. There are bookings starting to happen, but this, this is gonna be fairly bleak for uh, at least until August, I think. Yeah, and I can com completely relate to what you say in Europe. And some countries even seem to be competing with one another, trying to keep their domestic tourism in order to salvage that huge portion of GDP. As you said, countries like France or Spain, where actually you can travel into Spain, but you cannot go in France, even if it's sh a shorter, let's say, um, but it's closer than what you would have gone if you remain on the on the Spanish territory. And you say that, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. And of course, there will be disruptions into the traveler's behavior and focus on, on new things that were completely absent in the decision making of booking that property or the other. Um, so and we call that the, the new normal. And according to, to what you see, what this new normal could look like, does it translate in less strict cancellation policies, other, other things that we can already see with the market data? Yeah, so the new normal, I, I, be careful about commenting on this one, I do. Uh, I was on a podcast the other day where someone, well, I was on a panel and the host asked me, did I have a view on whether middle seats be booked in the future? And I, I, I gave a view, I have a view on everything, but I was remarkably unqualified to give any opinion on that subject. So... I try to stay away from uh, my suppositions on hygiene into the future. But what we do see in the data up to now is an enormous collapse in the booking lead time. That historically, booking lead times for two bedroom apartments, say, would be around 25, 27 days. Now they're nearly all under seven days. So I referenced before that uncertainty. So what's key to the hosts out there is to be flexible to those short-term guests. So even if you have very low occupancy a month away, that is no reason to believe that that occupancy will disappear. The other trend we've seen, which is well-documented also, is that shift to more mid-term stays. So average length of stay has climbed up remarkably from about 3.2 days across all markets to about 6.8 days, so that's a big change. But this one, is this a trend? No, I don't think so. This is because the traditional ways of, the majority of people who have used short-term rentals were doing it for a vacation and a smaller minority for a business trip, and then a smaller minority were using it for other reasons to do with their living circumstances, whether it's they're moving house and need someone to stay, They. Uh, a, their family broke apart and they need some temporary accommodation. And with the coronavirus crisis, we've seen so many of these need to have a quarantine. You're a healthcare worker who needs to be near to work. I'd be staggered if those trends survived out towards the end of the year. I think we'll, we'll see the, the, the new normal in terms of length of stay will look very much like the old one. And then really when I personally believe, I'm with the Glenn Fogel school of thought, that in one year from now, things will be remarkably similar to what they were before. In some way, I hate, hesitate to speak on the medical side, in some way we'll see some kind of resolution to the crisis of the contagious disease. And when that happens, they'll, people will still want to go on holiday, they'll still want to stay in short-term rentals, 
the the thirst for hygiene, I think, will abate over time, particularly as the disease becomes less of a threat. So all I can talk about now is these trends that we're seeing at the moment, and I find it highly unlikely that those trends in the data will persist uh, into 2021. Okay, so basically, if I can, let's say, reformulate what you say, those mid to long term bookings have always existed with vacation rental that has been a usage of this type of accommodation. And now the disappearance of the other bookings makes that look more important than it is. But you think that once travel resumes in one way or the other, we will go back to the type of length of stays that we were seeing before. Uh, I agree. And uh, I think maybe we're, we're going to talk about this later, but I may as well interject now. But there's also been a lot of coverage about how people will put their places on the medium-term market. So Airbnb has a new uh, front end that makes that seem convenient. But multi-month stay, and Brian Chesky has, of course, talked about facilitating that. However, I do think that when you, as the business owner, are looking at how to monetize your real estate assets, mm-hmm. you weigh up in your decision that I could get a long-term rental that is probably more reliable, but I have a lower return. However, I would like to take the higher risk of having short-term rentals, but in exchange, I will get a higher return on that asset. And that is why people got into short-term rentals in the first place, because you know the rental value of an apartment can be 1,000 euros a month, and consistently you can hope for 2,500 euros a month over the year. So that is why that you have that place as a short-term rental. And I don't think that economic choice will change. So although a lot of, uh, very sensibly, a lot of people at the moment are having unused inventory, wouldn't it be great if I could get a long-term tenant? And maybe some inventory will go that way in the short term. But the underlying economics, I don't think change. It's if you want to be in the short-term rental business, you optimize your business, your operations, your licensing for the short-term rental business, and that is where you'd like to return when you feel that is once again a good investment. Okay, so it's more a lifeline for some businesses to continue to operate when there's no demand, but you don't think that this will become the second harm of short-term rental or short-term rental property managers in the future. Yeah, and frankly, a desperate lifeline at the moment. We've definitely seen the emergence of a lot of Airbnb-style photographs on the property portals that are co-listing on the short-term rental platforms as well as the long-term rental platforms. But there, there is the same issue. Who is moving house voluntarily at the moment? Who is renting an apartment voluntarily at the moment? Now, that's, of course, the side of data we don't see is how many of those listings are taken up as long-term listings. But it's not as though that market is any better at the moment. So uh, I I think this is, once again, a blip and we'll see a return to uh, the way the short-term rental business operators run as soon as they feel confident uh, c- coronavirus has abated. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I think I completely agree with you on that. There's no disappearance of listing on short-term rental platform. There's more short-term rental listing going into mid to long-term platforms, but they remain available for short-term when it resumes. So it hasn't been that big of a shift so far. That's right. Overall global supply on Airbnb, we, we have falling uh, from January to April of 3%, which is, in the wider scheme of things, a pretty irrelevant number. You know, a few places have been pulled from the market, but those listings have generally stayed up. So the listing supply has not evaporated. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's the feeling we, we also have on our, on our hands. And so LDNA, so you provide data for the short-term rental industry, but also to people who want to invest in short-term rental. And we are seeing a lot of stories about Airbnb host, if we want to call them like that, or property managers who bought real estate assets in order to get their return quickly with uh, short-term rental uh, as a way to generate an income. Uh, Do you think that so-called Airbnb bubble can burst right now or that that will resume as soon as travel comes back? Uh, Well, it's a tough one. Okay, so... As a small business owner myself, we have not, uh, fortunately, never taken on outside financing. And when we weighed up that decision as whether to take out venture capital, some kind of money that will accelerate the growth rate of our business, we weighed carefully what that means. 
So, yeah. you know, it's a small business and you're making 100,000 a month and a venture capitalist gives you $10 million. They quite reasonably expect you to start losing half a million dollars a month. So in, Airbnb, in AirDNA's case, that would have meant at least 2xing our cost base. But you're, you're taking the risk, right? You're, you're seizing the opportunity and growing fast. But if there's any blips in your business model or in the wider macroeconomic environment, then you're going to have a real problem. And we've seen so many of the people who've raised substantial money walk into that problem, perhaps through no fault of their business model. And we saw Stay Alfred went down today, oh, yesterday, I think Jordan announced, yeah, he's not going to make it. They looked at bridge financing rounds, they couldn't make it. We've seen so many of these other players who are in real trouble if they're going to make it at all. It seems almost like only maybe Sondra and Vacasa might be in, uh, might be around at the end of this. And that is because they took on that money to grow fast. Right, so returning to your question, the underlying assets that we're talking about in these real estate businesses, their economics should not have changed significantly. So if you think if you bought a property for 400000 and your intention was to list it on a, sh a short-term rental site and that income would cover the mortgage and you take yourself pretty tight to the wire and you are unable to make those mortgage payments so you will have to lose that property however that property is still intact if you believe that in the near term by the end of the year beginning of next year you'll be able to see the same returns on that property as you could before and now you have a lot of distressed sellers out there who need to sell their property there should be some incredible bargains out there particularly if you think your time horizon is 30 years, you're not keyed in on absolutely making sure you have a future fundraise to uh, accelerate your growth. So I think there's a ton of opportunities. And obviously going into this crisis, I did fear for AirDNA. You know, we are a travel data company and travel, da travel data, I mean, it felt like we, we might be staring at face selling just a bunch of zeros, which would not be worth it for our customers. However, there's been so many people of that mindset who've been eyeing up the real estate, the, the short-term rental investing market, and now with their dry powder of capital to deploy, there's an enormous amount of good deals out there. So this bubble, I mean, a bubble, a bubble makes it sound as though, of course, you know, perhaps the prices that you had as an owner of these Airbnb businesses has fallen. However, uh, in the medium term, this business is not going away. And I think both on Expedia and Booking.com's earnings calls yesterday, they talked heavily about how they are going to invest into their, what they call alternative accommodations, which is, is fascinating that it's, they are the only real people who can really take a view with data on out when this crisis is falling, when people start booking again, are they going to prefer the guaranteed cleanliness of a hotel room, but also has the risk of interacting with lots of other people in the building? Or are they going to go for the slightly less guaranteed cleanliness standards of a typical vacation rental, but guaranteed isolation? And both those companies are observing it's going to be the latter. People feel much more comfortable in their own place separated from other people compared to a hotel so if you take that through that really means when the world starts traveling again september october it's going to be a tremendous time for vacation rentals in general yeah and i i completely agree with you on that and of course for the ones who still have access to capital that there's very good opportunities right now so it's not a crisis like the one of the subprimes that we had uh, in 2007 or 2008. It's completely different. It just demand stopped, but we see in some countries, as soon as measures are lifted, people are rushing towards vacation rental. And uh, even in very small places like islands where people just rent something outside of their home just to get another scenery for a couple of days or a couple of weeks after spending 10 weeks locked down into their own home. So that's, uh, yeah, I'm completely agreeing with you. I think the, the companies that will remain alive uh, in the fall or beginning of 2021 will have a huge amount of opportunities because some operators have stopped, basically. They went bankrupt, so there's a ton of assets to manage, and the owners are, might be looking for some professionals in order to manage that. 
or also companies will, uh, will of course come to the market and some others can acquire them. So that's of course a good opportunity for the one that survived that crisis. And in terms of those, uh, so there, there's lots of trends that we've discussed or blips like you, like you call them, uh, with, uh, with reason. Have you seen other trends that maybe we spoke less about in the in specialized, specialized media? Sorry. Um, I think one of the trends you really see looking into our data is actually how poorly hosts have adapted as a rule into dealing with this crisis. Okay, so obviously we, AirDNA, we sell very fine forward data reports where you can isolate different days. Uh, but also pragmatically, you can get a sense for this, uh, as I used to do as a host before there were companies like AirDNA around, to look at different dates, see your competitors look like, <laughs> How are you pricing? It is amazing the diver the diversion in performance between different uh, hosts. That some are getting bookings at reasonable prices and have good occupancy. Other people are getting nothing because they're hanging on to their prices of last year. So obviously, buying Eddie and A data would help you enormously. But even aside from that, it's been remarkable the lack of adjustment that hosts have made to this new situation. Similarly, and we saw of all the properties on Airbnb, as of two weeks ago, only 40% of them had any discount for a length of stay. Well, obviously in these times, particularly recently, where there's been those kind of, uh, you know, pandemic stays, we talked about health, uh, healthcare workers, isolation, these kind of things. The only real bookings were available for those ones, and they were longer bookings. So not to offer a length of stay discount was... Uh, you know, it was difficult to understand the thought process. And of course, the thought process would have been that it wasn't really considered. So because this news changes so quickly and what the pricing that was good yesterday can completely change as of the following day. Uh, for example, we saw on the, I think it was the 30th of April, the state of Georgia in the US announced that the lockdown restrictions were coming to an end. It was opening up again. That day on Airbnb and VRBO was the biggest day we'd ever seen for reservations for properties in Georgia. Because clearly there was so much pent up demand. And once people felt the uncertainty was taken away, then they were happy to book. So what does this mean for a property management company? You have to say, well, prior to that announcement, you should be thinking about what reservations reservations can you get over what time period do you want to take these reservations you're probably not looking to fill in late august with so much uncertainty but as soon as an announcement that makes a, a macro shock that changes your environment you have to be super fast to respond to make sure you're maximizing the profit of your uh, your properties a comparable example you can think is when the super bowl is announced to be in your city that's an extraordinary compression event. So if you leave your property out there at pre-Super Bowl announcement prices, and we see it every year, they get snapped up at a typical price, when in fact, if they had been more responsive over their pricing for that weekend, they could have earned 5x as much. So the overall message is, of course, to really understand your local market and be very quick inside your PMS, however you do it, to adjust your prices and adjust your policies depending on how things change. Yeah, that's, uh, and that's, that goes along with the level of professionalization that we can see across our industry. And of course, the one that remains really on top of market trends and this type of announcement, more specifically now that there's this huge pent up demand that can come, those are the ones that can still salvage some part of their season. And uh, that's, the, that's the perfect transition to my, uh, to, to my next question. So we see tons of countries that are still on lockdown, on partial lockdown. And uh, we can expect, as everyone is discussing in our industry, that summer season to be mostly fueled by the domestic market. What would be the difference that you can see between a, a country like France or the UK, or maybe UK is not a good example because it's still on lockdown, but France, let's say, let's take France, where they have a huge domestic market and other countries like Spain or Croatia who are usually uh, enjoying a huge portion of inbound tourism into their into their high season. Yeah, sure. We're actually uh, working on a report at the moment at AirDNA coming out later this week. Earlier, in fact, 
possibly when this uh, conference is launched, it will be available on our website that specifically looks at this question. So I don't have amazing answers, that's a work in progress. However, what I can say is, of course, that those, and we've reflected on it before, if you have a large overseas market, you really have to think about your competitive pricing. You really have to think there are so many quarantines, so many restrictions. You think for poor Spain. I myself was looking at renting a holiday villa in Ibiza in July. And I looked at the pricing and the pricing, I found those people who were more flexible in pricing, was looking at getting somewhere far nicer than I would ordinarily have booked. But then as you really start to look at the regulations and think, well, so if I want to, some friends of mine from England wanted to come, well, it's a 14-day quarantine and they may not be able to come. And then there'll be a 14-day quarantine coming back. And even in Spain, I see the news says, hopefully from the beginning of July, you'll be able to travel between provinces. Uh, between provinces. So this is, say, Barcelona to Ibiza. I, I, I can't have the confidence to book it. So even in these domestic situations, you really have to think so carefully about what is actually going to be possible. So for, we also have the, the fear that these restrictions that are gradually being lifted will prove premature and you will have to, the countries will have to retract on their, uh, their policies for allowing people in. So when it comes to how PMC is behaving in different countries, I really think it's... Uh, any booking is a good booking at the moment. I mean, you, even these domestic trends in Europe cannot be guaranteed, particularly if the country has a track record of a reasonable penetration of coronavirus. It, as I said at the start, it's just so tough in Europe and so straightforward in the US. And you know where's even more straightforward is Australia and New Zealand. We saw in the second week of May, bookings 150% higher than the first week of May. That there they feel confident. They had low penetration of coronavirus in the first place. They're, they have a, they talk about this air bridge between them where New Zealanders can visit Australia and vice versa. Uh, so they have they can act with much more confidence in in how they take bookings. But Europe, ah, it's just everything's unreliable. Everything's unreliable. So everything lies on the on the clarity of public measures and how they are how they are made and also the perception of travelers on their own safety when moving abroad or maybe just at 200 kilometers from their homes. And yes. uh, okay, so that's uh, that's quite valuable because everyone speaks about domestic tourism, but there's lots of thing in a country like Spain. What you call domestic can be different than what you see in England, for example. Or other, other parts of Europe or the world. And uh, so on our side, we discuss almost on a daily basis with, uh, with property managers. And uh, we, we are seeing that, <clears throat> sorry, some of them tell us they see a huge spike on booking and you alluded to that with the Australian case. When those, uh, when those um, restriction measures are lifted, were those just the lucky ones or does it translate into data? So, for example, as soon as there's an announcement, then you have booking or is uncertainty playing still a big role into, into that decision from travelers? Yeah, I, I mentioned that data point from Georgia in the US. It's huge. It's huge. The, the level of a government announcement, what that can do for bookings. And you just think as, as wannabe travelers out there, if, if you were fortunate enough not to have your income and livelihood seriously affected by this crisis you probably save quite a lot of money and the one thing you really think of is is a vacation so as soon as you get uh, some kind of official okay from the government then that translates into enormous surges in demand so i, I, I would, unfortunately i don't have the same data for france after the 28th of april but it is imperative as a property management company as soon as there's a material announcement from your government, the best thing to do is stop your listings right then, take the time, the couple of hours to reconfigure your pricing based on this new reality and make sure your pricing, what your offer is, reflects the new reality because they are tremendous external shocks when government edicts change. Okay, so let's... So for, for the property managers listening to us, be careful of what your government say. And as soon as there's an official announcement, take the right pricing decision, relying on to 
the market data that you can see into your into your areas. And speaking of areas that might be doing better than others, if you if from what you see, what are the destinations that are popping the best at the moment? And if you can build some rule of thumbs for that. Yeah, I mean it's clear we did some analysis of urban versus suburban versus rural bookings. Rural bookings are almost similar during the crisis huh? because they were particularly at this time of year in the Northern Hemisphere, they were less popular. But now that is the only show in town. That quarantine tourism element was real and con continues to be real. I know in some countries there was a great deal of social opprobrium attached to uh, rural bookings. But in the US, where there wasn't so much done, so much of that, the, some rural areas, it was like July the 4th weekend and continues to be busy as people look at their small urban apartments and think I'd much rather sit out if I have to stay at home I'd much rather if I have the finances sit in a more comfortable rural safer location but of course the flip side of that is urban areas are a disaster when they are they are, truly are a disaster we both live here in Barcelona and you feel we are many many months away from Airbnb traveling being permitted properly in Barcelona City and the uh, I think we also have to consider for these urban areas I certainly felt this as I went out for my evening exercise last night the popular acclaim for how much people are enjoy, enjoying the cities without the raft of travelers going through them so whilst uh, some countries I think Greece in particular is anxiously looking at their GDP and how much visitor how important visitors thought to that city are, I think it might be quite a stiff regulatory environment in some cities as, uh, as vacation rentals come back on the market. But yes, if you're sitting on urban, urban short-term rentals at the moment, you have a problem that may not go away this year. Yeah, that's, uh, that's of course more complicated. And of course, the isolation you can have into a short-term rental property is not as obvious when you're in a city and you're into a building when you have other people living. So that's of course, and the regulation as well might come a bit more stronger than they were before. And in Barcelona, that could become really strong because the regulations are already quite, quite strict. So that will be more complicated for your band to resume. That's, uh, that, that's of course the, the reality. And um, so there's, as you say, and as our discussion can illustrate, there's still a lot of uncertainty around the future of our industry, what it will look like at the moment. What are the most current attempts that you see to capture demand from the, from the PMs? Okay, so there's the quantitative and the qualitative angle to this. Let's talk about the quantitative angle. Is your pricing really competitive at the moment? Because, as I mentioned before, so many properties are priced as though coronavirus had never happened. So realistically, if you're looking to get cash into your business in the early part of summer, you have to make sure your pricing is lower and more competitive uh, and competitive with other your competitors in that marketplace. Similarly, those weekly and monthly bookings are just gold at the moment. Because booking volume is so low, if you can get a month's booking, i.e. 100% occupancy for that month, that is tremendously valuable, far more so than it was ordinarily. And as I referenced, so few uh, property management companies have embraced these changes to weekly and monthly discounts. Certainly uh, for the short end of the, you know, coming through June and July, where there's so much uncertainty in the marketplace. And then qualitatively, as you look through the listings that are out there, it all, you almost expect the host to reference the existence of coronavirus. So your good listing, one, can talk about its cleanliness standards, of course, if you have them. So this, uh, people on the margin, this can be extremely important to them booking. But also, I think even more importantly, is painting out what happens if you're unable to make that trip. It's not enough to say, just click the box to say, I have a flexible cancellation policy. You need to reiterate that in the listing to make sure people are aware if this is the path you want to go down and have a flexible policy, which is highly recommended at this time, you, it's absolutely clear to your traveler. It's in the first line of your comment, and maybe it's even in the title. So you draw people in. 
Whereas if you just rely on your previous text to your listing, the feeling for the potential guest is you are not considerate of their situation and the difficulties they might have. So I would urge all the PMCs to make sure that your listing text, your listing policies reflect that there is a contagious disease on the loose and it's not just whatever you wrote two years ago and think that will be the same. Yeah, and that I completely agree and that's communication in, term, in, in times of crisis is really important, whether it is towards your owners to tell them that they might not expect the same income and also towards your guests to tell them exactly what they can expect in case they cannot travel for any reason, coronavirus being one of those. And uh, that, so yeah, as, as we say, the property managers are not the only one who suffer from that crisis. The travelers as well, they've had to deal with the cancellation policies of every channel, the goodwill of some owners or property managers, and it also, it was hard for them because their holidays that they were maybe waiting for six months have just disappeared and instead of that you're just locked down in your home for two months so um, so that's uh, so, so that's also the, the sorry the, the reality for the travelers and that might translate sometimes in bad review or for, for the property managers that did not accept to cancel a booking and then the guest just goes and vent up his rage on the on the review are you seeing that on some otas and from the data that you've seen some properties being uh some properties reputation sorry being damaged by the action that have been taken by the property manager or the ota during the covid 19. yeah it's difficult it's difficult to really look into this but because of course airbnb famously allowed everyone to cancel their reservation and kind of stuck the host with the bill and because of that mechanism that, is, they were, that, that, that potential guest did not leave a review because they were unable to leave a review because they cancelled their reservation. So in terms of, um, that's when we, uh, we scrape all, all the reviews that have ever happened in Airbnb and put some time into analysing them. But that has not been reflected in those reviews just because of the nature of the way the cancellations happened up to now. So fortunately on Airbnb for the host, any uh, angry, raging reviews more related to coronavirus than, than anything to do with a property have, have not appeared. Uh, and there may be other platforms or you know, the non-major OTAs where you're able to give negative reviews. So the, the classic is Google Maps, of course, where you can put any review you like on there and that can tie back to the property. But uh, I don't think this will be a material concern. And then if people take the time to read the reviews, I think there is a common understanding these are extraordinary times. So hopefully, I don't think this, well, PMCs have many, many concerns, and hopefully this is one of the smaller ones. Okay. And so we alluded a bit to, to that before, but now the, the scarcity of demand becomes a reality for every property manager when before COVID, it was more the increase of demand and that wave that everyone was, uh, was happily surfing. And if you compare now the, the property managers that are getting the best results versus the ones who are completely shattered, what would be the, the rule of thumb that we can establish here? The clear rule of thumb is looking at the data, I mean, obviously as a data salesman, I say that, but uh, you don't just need our AirDNA's data to carefully calibrate your pricing based on the latest political developments, the latest travel guidance, the, late, the trends that have emerged since then, and the disaster is to just continue uh, with whatever policies you had last year as you had this year. And let me be frank, if you, lived and worked and had 30 properties in a seaside de destination. You know the market well, you know when high, higher demand is, you know when the local town festivals are. Your need for a company like AirDNA's data uh, was, was lower in the old times. You know, if you really want to squeeze the last couple of percentage points of profit out of it, which if you're a serious business is what you should be doing. And, Companies like AirDNA will provide the data. Uh, but now it is a question, it can be a question of life or death understanding the future demand, future data. Nearly all the PMCs out there will be hurting, and some of them will be close to the edge of whether they can continue. You know, whether it depends on the, the government furlough schemes and how well they've been able to reduce their cost base and so forth. But if you're pricing on what happened last year, 
you're destined for disaster. So even if you, uh, you know, you're not interested in going through what a data company can provide, just looking around, be a guest, do some mystery shopping, see what it's like to try and book a place for a week at the end of June in your area and see how your properties stack up against the competition. And if, if you aren't doing that, you are going to be at the bottom of the list. This is a terrible time, but it, is, it, can, it can go from being okay for people who really get into the numbers, really get into their listings, really get into the data, because you know for sure a lot of your competitors are not, and you can outperform them. And I think as a property management company, you could also see this as an opportunity that you can really showcase your skills. You could say, look how I did during this. This is the attention I have. How did your property manager do for the property when you're looking to win new business? And it's a real time to shine, to show your forward thinking, you're data driven, you're going to get the best revenue for your owners. So it's definitely a, it's tempting when the days are so bad to, to give it all up as a bad job. But this is the time you can really shine at the moment, keep your business alive and have a great hope that you can expand your business well in next year. So once again, a perfect transition with what would be my, my last question. I, I remember you last year in uh, the Vacation Rental World Summit in Como saying that uh, we are in an industry where you can do well even if you're not 100% professional. Do you think it's still the case today or will the survivors be the one able to showcase the best professionalism, the initiatives that they've taken and how well they've been able to cope with that unexpected crisis? Yeah, it's, it's a great comment. Um, I, when I made that statement, I remember you, we've been around in the business five years, which is quite long in, in terms of a lot of the companies you see in the space. You see some companies come in with a business model, utterly fail, come back the next year with a different business model, and somehow still manage to raise capital and find people who are willing to bankroll this business. Similarly, you could see uh, chains of properties that were shoddily run, but the market was so hot, the demand rising so much that they could survive. And as to my last comment, that's no longer the case, right? This is really the fittest that will survive. The people who can manage to keep a careful eye on their cost base, who can expand their revenue through thoughtful pricing. These are the people that will survive, and those people will be in a position to pick up the remnants of these other businesses. However, I would say, as an industry, the short-term rental is a confusing one because most of the people you and I speak to are serious business people or property managers, but the casual host is still out there. And the casual host, I think, will always be out there and always do okay, because often, if you're just running one property, your second home, you can pay, you can give more one-on-one -on -one love and attention than even a well-run property management company. And there is, a, there is a thought that there may be more of these second homes coming on the market. There are currently uh, just under a million listings on Airbnb for the US. There are 10 million second homes in the US. So I think it would be interesting if we think in terms not, not of coronavirus, but a general recession, how many of those more homes will come onto the market. And they can do okay still. So it would be interesting times to see how the industry will develop in the next 12 months. Yeah, of course, it's really interesting. And let's not forget that the, the huge mainstream popularity of short-term rental came just after the 2008 crisis. So it might as well be that there will be more and more supply because people might not have enough financial means to keep those properties with them. So it might also become the new uh, the new reign of some smaller host and also the professional property management companies that we are used to to discuss with well tom uh, thanks a lot for for this chat that we just had i think there's lots of things that can be food for thought for the people that listen to us and uh, no doubt that our dna can help them taking the best decisions in the future thanks ever so much thanks ever so much thanks see you soon tom bye-bye